Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kofi Akamani. Dr. Kofi Akamani is an assistant professor of forest recreation and conservation social science in the Department of Forestry at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. He received his PhD in natural resources with specialization in conservation social science from the University of Idaho. Prior to that, Kofi received his Master of Philosophy in Culture, Environment, and Sustainability from the University of Oslo and his Bachelor of Science degree in Planning in Ghana. His research involves integration of concepts from social ecological systems research and rural sociology, among other fields, with the aim of gaining a theoretical understanding of human environment interactions across multiple scales and informing policies that promote human well-being and ecosystem health across the rural urban continuum. Since joining SIUC, Kofi has collaborated with colleagues and graduate students on various research projects aimed at understanding and enhancing the resilience of resource-dependent communities and the adaptive governance of forests, water resources, and agricultural landscapes in Ghana, the U.S., and elsewhere. And just to refresh everyone's memory, they're each going to talk for 10 minutes, and then we'll have some questions um, for each of them. So I do apologize if I have to show you my time cards. It's just to be helpful. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this interesting conversation on building resilient communities uh, and economies in the Southern Illegal region in response to climate change and other drivers of change. And so in this presentation, I'll be focusing on changing approaches to the management of natural resources, uh, forest policy in particular, uh, and its implications for building the resilience of communities. And so I'll begin by talking about uh, changing assumptions about human nature interactions, how that has influenced the way we manage forest resources, and then in the latter part, I'll look at changing approaches to enhancing the sustainable communities. So one of the changes that have been occurred over the past few decades is the idea of sustainable development, and this is uh, now a popularized concept, uh, looking at an integrated approach to achieving social, economic, and ecological goals. Uh, as opposed to older approaches to development that emphasized economic progress uh, at global and national levels. Another change that has been occurring is the notion that, or the understanding that past policies on conservation and development largely were based on the notion that humans are separate from nature and that natural ecosystems can be understood uh, or explained and predicted and controlled using the best science available. And so those assumptions that are being rejected now in favor of an alternative approach uh, since the 1970s that posits humans as integral parts of nature and that the interaction between the two uh, exhibits the attributes of complex adaptive systems. Uh, difficult to predict and knowledge about the system is never uh, complete. So how do we uh, propose sustainable development in such a complex environment of integrated systems of humans and nature? Uh, and the literature suggests that we need to build resilience. And the idea of resilience is about the ability of coupled social and ecological systems to adapt to change while being able to maintain their structures and functions. Uh, resilience is, uh, has been appraised in a number of ways. Coping refers to short-term responses to threats and opportunities. Adaptation is about learning and making structural adjustments to maintain existing conditions. Transformational change is where existing conditions become undesirable and where more radical changes are needed. So based on these ideas, we are going to see changes in the way that we manage natural resources. Uh, in the field of forest policy before the 1900s, uh, forest resources were largely unregulated. They were largely in the hands of the private sector and they were uh, exploited without uh, regulatory mechanisms. And that led to various adverse consequences. In the latter part of the, 19, uh, of the 1800s, we saw the emergence of the conservation movement and the idea of sustained yield forest management emerged as part of that movement. 
In the 1960s, the idea broadened to multiple use sustained yields, which broadened the management goals of forest policy. And then in the 1990s, we saw a shift towards the idea of ecosystem management. So what is multiple use and sustained yield forest management? Uh, these principles were based, again, on the belief that forest ecosystems essentially fluctuates around a single equilibrium and as such can be predicted uh, and controlled. Management goals were all about efficiency and output maximization, uh, focusing on the economically uh, valuable components of the ecosystem. Uh, the science was reductionist, it was quantified, and decision making relied on uh, regulatory mechanisms from government representatives. And so this approach that lasted through the 1960s and even into the 1970s has been critiqued for focusing too much on economic benefits and neglecting other social and political components. Uh, there's also the notion that this approach was not participatory enough and that the complexity of social and ecological systems were not adequately integrated or addressed. So, shortfalls of this approach became clearer in the late 1980s, and by the 1990s, there were widespread conflicts uh, in response to various ecological threats that were posed by the older approach. Uh, so, the idea of ecosystem management was born in the era of President Clinton in the Pacific Northwest. And the Northwest Forest Plan was one of the first forest plans that was adopted based on these principles. And so in the ecosystem management approach assumes that humans are an integral part of nature and that they behave as complex systems. Uh, management goals are integrated. The uh, ecosystem management is a way to achieve sustainable development. And so the goal is not only on the economic component, but also on the social and the ecological. It requires using multiple sources of knowledge, uh, including the social sciences and non-scientific ways of knowing. And decision making requires the use of institutional mechanisms that are collaborative and also are flexible enough to promote learning and adaptation. So some of the factors that have been known to contribute to the shift towards ecosystem management in most cases, we see various crises, social and ecological. So social conflicts often uh, trigger those changes. But other factors include enabling policies and leadership and other factors. So what does this mean for communities? We've talked about a shift from sustained yield and multiple use to ecosystem-based forest management. But what does it mean for forest communities? In the era of sustained yield, uh, the idea was that communities can, the well-being of communities can be sustained through the, uh, through the stabilization of uh, the flow of forest products to local minerals uh, as a way of maintaining timber jobs and employment opportunities. And so community stability was really a major political motivation for pursuing policies on sustained yield. But now that we are in an era of ecosystem management, what does that mean for communities? And the idea is that now we need to be talking about community resilience. So community stability is about ensuring that we maintain a stable flow of uh, forest products, particularly timber from national forests, uh, and that by feeding that into local mills, we can maintain a constant uh, income and employment opportunities, thereby maintaining the well-being of communities. That assumption has been critiqued as being uh, flawed in the sense that it tends to uh, control various forces of change within and outside the community. Uh, but importantly, the relationship between communities and forests were not fully understood and communities were not adequately involved in decision making. The community resilience approach assumes that communities are always exposed to change and to sustain communities, they need to be, uh, their communities need to have the ability to respond to those forces of change. And so communities are dynamic, uh, the resilience approach is more integrative uh, in terms of the way that community well-being is conceptualized. And importantly, it recognizes that communities do have certain resources that contribute to their internal ability to respond to change. So what are these resources? Uh, they are typically characterized as, cap as capital assets. And so they are economic, they are social, they include physical infrastructure, they include natural resources, uh, and human capital, which is the knowledge and skills of community members. Another key component besides the capital assets is community institutions and organizations. 
uh, institutions are the formal and the informal rules that shape uh, interaction between people and nature. And they are where we have effective institutions, they can play important roles in terms of organizing uh, and sharing information, uh, make, providing incentives for collective action, and also providing opportunities and, and enhancing access to appropriate resources for change. So a framework like this captures the idea of community resilience, that communities are part of a multi-level world and that access to institutions and resources influence differences and responses to change and they have implications for the outcome. So in an era of ecosystem management, what kinds of challenges and opportunities we need to be paying attention to as we try to build the resilience of communities? One is that we need to pay attention to the way that policies are designed and implemented. Policy design and implementation processes can enable or constrain opportunities for access to information and resources uh, and incentives. Communities are not always capable in terms of having institutions and access to respond to change, and we need to prioritize building those resources. But we also need to remember that uh, community interactions are also influenced by external factors, and we need to build the ability to respond to those surprises. So to conclude, policy changes have been occurring in the field of forest policy uh, towards ecosystem management that have resulted in a change in the way that we think about community sustainability from stability to resilience. The resilience approach is important because it enhances community survival in an era of climate change. But we need to pay attention to further understanding the mechanisms for enhancing community members' awareness and their interests as well as their capacity to respond to various forces of change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmani. We have a lot to think about for ecosystem management. We want to go next to Kelly Pearson. Kelly Pearson is a native of Southern Illinois. She's worked for the U.S. Forest Shawnee National or U.S. Forest Service Shawnee National Forest for 28 years, focusing on recreation, trails, wilderness, and volunteers. In 2005, Kelly created the Shawnee Volunteer Corps program for the Shawnee National. The Shawnee Volunteer Corps Exper Experiential Service Program has grown exponentially over the years from its humble beginnings. In 2018, 360 volunteers provided 12,323 12, hours of stewardship service to the Shawnee National Forest. Kelly also manages the seven designated wilderness areas on the Shawnee National Forest, which comprises approximately 20,000 acres, or 10% of the National Forest. Managing volunteers and stewarding the wilderness is a monumental task for one person, so over the years, Kelly has been quietly building partnerships with other agencies national and regional volunteer organizations and local nonprofit organizations to connect others to their wild lands and special places and to accomplish the important work of stewardship on the national forest. As a member of the River to River Trail Summit organization, a public-private partnership, Kelly is part of a grassroots effort to support local businesses and promote responsible ecotourism in Southern Illinois. So I want to talk to you today about the public-private partnership that surrounds the rejuvenation of the River, River Trail here in Southern Illinois. I want to talk to you a little bit about the trail facts, um, a little bit of history, uh, who the summit team is, what we've accomplished, and what we're hoping to do into the future. So the River, River Trail is 157 miles. Long, it goes from the Ohio River to the Mississippi River. It goes through five very small towns or villages. Um, it crosses national forest land, including five designated wilderness areas. It goes through two state parks. It goes through um, Crab Orchard National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it lays on county roads, public roads. So it's a, it's really on the landscape here, and um, it's 
really becoming more and more a thing to do uh, for avid hikers. Uh -oh. Oh. So those stars are lighting up the small villages I mentioned earlier. Uh, so the River River Trail was a dream of John O'Dell, who was a retired school superintendent. He wanted to develop a hiking culture in Southern Illinois, and he also wanted to invite other long distance hikers to experience the beauty and natural wonders of Southern Illinois. He felt like this trail was a good way to bring folks here. Um, so that was in the 1990s, and here we are almost 30 years later. So a group of us decided it was time to take a look at the infrastructure that is the River River Trail. So the folks in this picture here, like they wouldn't all get together for brunch on Sunday, if you know what I mean, but they could come together and rally around the importance of the River River Trail in Southern Illinois. And so we, we meet twice a year, beginning in 2017. And in our first meeting, we came up with um, this set of goals, if you will, and we want to improve the visitor experience. So can people find their way on the River to River Trail? Uh, do they have enough information to be successful on the trail? Um, and then how can we protect the natural resources that they're using while they're here? And then how can this in turn promote Southern Illinois as some kind of small economic engine? So those were the ideas that we um, all came together around after our first meeting, and lucky for us, oh, well, so there they are. So it's the River River Trail Society, IDNR, Crabbertree National Wildlife Refuge, Touch of Nature at SIU, uh, AIM Wild, which is a regional wilderness stewardship group, and Southernmost Illinois Tourism Bureau. So those were the original partners at the table, and beginning in 2017, but over the past couple years, here are more partners that we've engaged, either through service projects or um, working with our grants or whatever. So what started out as about 10 people around the table has really grown into something uh, pretty large, actually. So um, lucky for us, we had an opportunity to apply for a trail grant, um, a national trail grant, and we were successful. And, and we did phase one, and we started working on our first goal, which was the signing, you know, improving the information that was out there. And um, we had students that we hired from SIU, so every mile of the River to River Trail got hiked, and then uh, trailblazers were put up. We also put up um, really nice portal signs at the beginning and end of the trail, and then at certain milestones along the trail, we had um, information signs, and you'll see pictures of them. And then, and we also were successful in year two, so that's when we really started to work on the infrastructure or backlog part of the River River Trail, 157 miles. On the Shawnee National Forest, there are uh, one full-time person, me, and some seasonal people to manage all the miles that we have on us. So, uh, this really jump-started our efforts. So these are just some of the ways that our partners um, help us be successful. River River Trail Society, uh, GPS every mile, created maps on Avenza, made them available to the public. That's huge. They redid the trail guide. It's available um, online. And they also host the official website for the River River Trail. Oh, there's our beautiful signs right there. And the Shawnee Trail Conservancy, they're, um, uh, an all trails, all use group, and they developed a um, volunteer program to use their animals to haul gravel into the wilderness. Nothing motorized or mechanized in the wilderness, so we have to use horses and mules. And they they didn't know how to do it, but we worked with them, and they have hauled. I think in 2018, we hauled about 80,000 pounds of gravel with these guys. So that's pretty amazing. And then there's us, and you know we uh, help in a lot of ways. We help write the grants. We recruit a lot of volunteers to work on the ground. Um, our cartographer worked with them to develop the maps. Oh, I gave us two pages. Anyway, <laughs> and then of course the Friends of the Shawnee National Forest, 
they administer the grants that we get. Um, they can actually hire people much easier than we can, so without all the government red tape, give some opportunities to students and locals. And um, they also host um, service days as well. And so in looking to the future, we've already developed um, five multi-day trail loop opportunity. So those we get a lot of folks who want to backpack for three to five days and they want to loop because the River River Trail is linear. So now we can say, oh, here, here's a map. Um, so that's, kind of, that's a big deal. Uh, marketing, so the Forest Service can't market, but certainly our non-for-profits can. So what, why, does, why come to Southern Illinois and do the River River Trail? Well, they're going to tell you why. And then we'll continue to do trail maintenance. It's never ending. And then we'll, as opportunities come forward for grants, we'll be doing those. Um, so recently, Boston University was here. They come every year for a week, and they worked on the River to River Trail. We just uh, hosted an AmeriCorps and Triple C team with SIU and Giant City for nine weeks, and they they uh, did a lot of miles of maintenance on the River to River Trail. So there, that's there you go. start pursuing ecosystem management strategies to make more loop trails. Sounds like a good plan right there. All right, next we are going to hear from Adina Rebus. Get my page. Adina Rebus is the programs coordinator for the City of Springfield Public's Work Department. In this role, she oversees the Division of Waste and Recycling as well as helps develop and manage the activities and or staff of several other community outreach and or educational programming related to public works. The Division of Waste and Recycling is directly responsible for developing and overseeing programs such as electronic recycling, large item pickup, yard waste collection, branch collection hazards, waste collection, residential room to room guide, adopt a street programming, city recycle bins, and various educational outreach programs, including the city's annual Earth Day celebration. Before working with the city, Adina worked as an organizer for the NGO called Elevate Energy in Springfield, Illinois, and downstate based out of only Illinois. In this role, she managed and implemented community-based strategies for educating and engaging individuals on alternative energy and energy efficiency. She holds two bachelors, one in science and uh, the other in art, as well as a master's in environmental studies from the University of Illinois Springfield. So let's welcome the Dina, please. everyone. So I'm not necessarily going to talk about the waste and recycling programs in general. I'm going to be talking about plastics. A lot of people, when they think of plastics, they think of your single use. You hear all the time about plastic bags and how bad they are and maybe some of the plastics in general that we kind of throw away and you kind of push forward the notion of recycling plastics. But it's a very confusing area for a lot of people, especially when you look at the bottom of a plastic bottle and you see those different numbers, or you look at containers and you have numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and this random eight that was thrown out. And most people don't necessarily know what those numbers are, but kind of the bigger picture of plastics is they don't necessarily know what really happens to plastics. So just to give you a little bit of history here, I'm gonna go way back to 1950. Um, that's literally when plastics really started coming into our mainstream, onto the shelves being put into industry, almost into everything. And since 1950, since plastics came into our overall stream, literally we have pumped 1.66 quadrillion pounds. And that's a number that we can't actually quantify in our mind. We've never seen anything that weighs that much. So a lot of people put it into more smaller terms. And I say smaller in quotations because it's not smaller, it's just a different measurement. So they say 8.3 billion tons. Not sure if that sounds any better. Again, a number that we can't actually quantify in our mind, right? But here's the idea, 1.66 quadrillion pounds of plastics, we live in a plastic planet. And it's because of all the single-use plastics, not just the plastic bags and the bottles, but the tiny little stuff. 
Um, I'm in a hotel room right now. I got some coffee this morning. I had a little creamer and the stick and whatever it is to make coffee in the morning. And everything was in plastics. Teeny tiny little plastics. Think about kids' toys. It's plastic inside of plastic inside of plastic inside of plastic. Tiny little things that you pull off of your clothes that have the uh, tag attached and that little piece of plastic that's attached. All that stuff in plastics and it's everywhere. It's in everything. Um, and if we continue kind of on the train where we kind of use these single-use plastics, dispose of them like crazy, if we continue how we've been actually using it in another, what is it, it's 1939 years, we literally will have created 34 billion tons. Look at that. 1950 to 2019, 8.3 billion tons, another 34 billion tons created by 2050. So people talk about climate change all the time, and obviously it's a huge, huge thing with multiple issues going on. The idea is that actually the plastic issue is a crisis all on its own to the point that we are literally living in a plastic planet, and we created it. So to give you an idea, um, 8.3 billion tons of plastic, if you spread it ankle deep waist, about 10 inches high, you can literally cover an entire area the size of Argentina. I just kind of throw out a couple quotes for you. This is the eighth, eighth largest country in the world, and that's how much plastic is out there, just to kind of quantify it. So these are pictures of landfills, and I'm sure you've seen some of them. These aren't necessarily American landfills. We have a lot of different um, legislation that makes it so that you have to cover it every single day with soil, whatever it may be. These are different landfills in other countries, but even if we throw something away here, it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't get to uh, shoreline or into the ocean or everywhere across the world. We're all connected and we forget about that. So in 2018, last year, National Geographic, they did a very, very long study um, and the entire uh, magazine was dedicated to plastic and it was literally called Pla Planet or Plastic or Planet for Plastic, meaning that basically our entire planet, we've turned into this plastic planet all of our own doing and they had all of this information out there. But the thing that really hit people and hit mainstream um, the New York Times picked it up and you heard a lot of people talking about it, is the quote that basically, where is it at? There will be more plastic than fish by weight in the oceans by 2050 if the current trends continue. Remember, go a couple slides before and a couple, or by 2050, we're going to have another 34 billion tons of plastic, right? The idea is that plastics are everywhere. So the next slides I'm going to be showing you, I just kind of want to compound this down because I know you've seen pictures. These next slides are very graphic, <clears throat> but it's literally to give you the nasty, and then I'll give you some ideas of progress right where we're going. So anybody who's um, sensitive, you might just want to close your eyes for right now. I'm an animal lover, so these are, pictures are hard. But in general, millions of whales, birds, seals, turtles, any type of aquamarine life, what have you, millions die every single year because of the plastics that are in the ocean for multiple different reasons. And so these are some very nice pictures, and I'll say those like nice being in quotation marks. Um, these are some pictures in the upper right, obviously where plastics were ingested by animals. That one bird there you can see could not get the actual plastic cap off of its beak, so it ended up dying. The turtle on the bottom there has plastic wrapped around its shell. Literally that turtle is not going to survive that much longer, but it's everywhere and it's in everything. Um, You've heard stories, and I'm sure you've seen some circulation of this. We are having the world over where whales are being beached, and when they actually open these whales up, they're literally bombarded with plastic bags because they can't actually eat and take anything in. They're suffocating through these plastic bags. Um, so you see stomachfuls in all different types of whales, not just one type of whales, all kinds. And here's the real, real truth of it, right? It's our fault in general. So it's not just marine life, we're talking about all life, terrestrial life, from the macro to the micro, and the micro people don't talk about, but it's everywhere in every single environment. And so these are just some pictures to get you to kind of think about it. But thinking about, those that close their eyes, you can open your eyes now. Um, but thinking about the micro level, this is the scary thing about it. And I say that we live in a plastic planet because it's literally in the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, the food that we eat. They've done plenty of studies when it comes to marine life and even terrestrial life where they start looking at the DNA and has it gotten into their DNA in general, they've been finding out that this is true more and more and more. If they find it in aquamarine life, like fish and things like that, it doesn't take much more for it to start jumping the food chains. And we're eating fish, we're ingesting plastics, we're breathing it in. So it's just a matter of time before it literally starts changing our DNA to the very micro level. 
how do plastics really affect us on a larger scale is what we should be thinking about and taking into consideration. Very quick slides, nine reasons obviously to stay away from single use plastics, all the reasons talked about as far as getting them out of our actual environment, but all the reasons beyond that is to basically end or stop some of the leaching of toxins into every single environment. So, Here's where we get to the innovation part of it, right? It's the power of the messaging, imagery, technology, things like that. Where are we going from here? There's a lot of artists. One of the biggest things about teaching people about plastics is education. And artists the world over are trying to do that. We have 3D artists creating different arts to bring people attention to what's going on. <laughs> we have um, two-dimensional artists moving forward that are literally trying to show images to people saying that it's not just a human world, it's an animal world, an animal being from, again, the micro to the macro. Um, you have very powerful images like this. It's not anything in your face, what have you. It's literally Plastic Planet now in our theaters. It's kind of a neat one. This is a neat one, a child actually picking up where's all the trash heading, showing to be the oceans. Again, more poignant pictures, people seeing things kind of realizing the birth defects that can happen through plastics and where we're getting to that. And then you have literally the power of technology, which is taking a lot of different turns and shifts that a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of. We had our keynote talk about pyrolysis as far as turning um, different things into biochar. The same thing is happening with plastics. What is plastics? It's crude oil from its original source. So it's literally taking plastics, doesn't matter about the number, forget the number, throw it out. You take all plastics, put them all together in these big, huge machines, pyrolysis machines, most of those plastics down to crude oil in a very um, condensed form with heat, and literally you create these two different offsets being biochar and crude oil, and then you have to take that crude oil and you can create diesel fuel and gasoline. So there are innovations being made with the plastics. How do you clean up these worlds? You can literally go look and Google China or Plastic China, and you can see all these different towns that are made up just hordes and tons of plastics all over the place. A company, Renewology, is doing just that. They're literally using that technology as far as to, tr to try and clean up the ocean, the microplastics, the small, small plastics you can't even see that are in our clothes, those synthetic fibers. Every time we wash our clothes, it goes into the ocean, goes into our water sources. So they got all kinds of different materials um, that they use to create these different machines that actually can condense the plastic back down to their crude oil sense. Getting off that, we're going to go to the power of action. Here's another group. This is actually really good as far as like innovation, what can you do with plastics. This is a group from the Netherlands. Very interesting. They've been able to come up with an idea where they can literally take plastic, melt it down, kind of trap some of the noxious gases, and then if you are creative in any way, you make a maker space. And this is exactly what they did here. And there's places all over the world that have actually picked up the call to do this. It's, I kind of priced it out. It costs about anywhere six to $10,000 to create the machines that they made available to everyone that would actually shred the plastics, melt the plastics, what temperatures you need for specific plastics, and then create whatever you want out of it. So it's taking plastic, molding it into something else and keeping it in our stream instead of it going to the landfill and stuff like that. So one word that I kind of want to leave you guys with is rather than you hear it all the time, sustainability, that word gets twisted, turned, molded into meaning different things, is this word that's starting to catch on through academia called thriveability. And this is literally about looking at the situation, adapting, learning, and acting, literally getting up and you can do something too. So look it up. Um, I really suggest that anyone, everyone really kind of use that term thriveability in your community, in your home, in your workplace to kind of thrive things and move things forward. <laughs> Thank you, Adina. Our next panelist, Paul Anderson. Since his retirement in two thousand three. From teaching geography at Illinois State University, Paul Anderson has been instrumental in the innovations and advancement of pyrolytic gasification, which includes the creation of charcoal while generating combustible gases, wood gas, for a separate purpose, such as heat for a cook stove. Paul Anderson has lived over 20 adult years outside of the USA, Peru, Vietnam, Colombia, Australia, and Brazil, Mozambique, and other shorter states elsewhere. He has a unique, inter uniquely international perspective and is highly concerned about climate change and the future of America, as shown in two recent books, The Nehemiah Papers, 14 Essays, and Capitalist Carol, the novella, which I just finished reading the other day, and it should be in every economics course, I thought. 
Um, and that's, you can go to capitalism21.org, both are free as ebooks. So please welcome Paul. Perspective, a, a national perspective, and then we'll reflect back towards Southern Illinois. Carbon economy, there are different scales for all the things which I'm talking about. The personal, the area is around here, or the world, and things in between. I am offering to you, I hope I'm offering to you, some opportunities for participation. I am actively recruiting. I want you I need my Uncle Sam hat and all that good stuff. We'll just put something together and see if we can make some things happen. So uh, that's, what I, that's what I'm after into here. I have uh, several themes that I'm going to go through in, into here. And each theme merits 20 minutes and I've got 10 total and everything. I'll be here tomorrow for all day with Albert Bates. So if you're around here, we can take any of these things to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the limit, okay? So today is very brief. There's 36 slides, and some of them will be up there for less than two seconds. So be prepared for that. Not that really taking notes into here. In reverse order of those things which I put up there, future, 2030, 2050, 2100, I believe it is going to be far worse than is being presented to us as to what it's going to be. I am a grandfather and I worry for my grandchildren and their children. They will be into the 22nd century. I must care. And if you don't agree with me on that, feel free to argue with me at separate other time. But glad to do. There's a lack of urge, sense of urgency. The two mega problems of climate change and lack of caring. It also relates to population growth, but those are two big problems. And those problems led me to writing two different books, which are out in the back and stuff in there. I'll em emphasize, first of all, they are free. You can get them, download them as an ebook at capitalism21.org. If you want a paper copy, I've got some in the back here. Please make a donation to a charity or something, or whatever my choice. Something that I'm working on, you'll see things which I'm dealing with. Nehemiah Papers, I won't go into the details about it, but it is expressing things about the, uh, what is the basis of Capitalism 21, what is wrong with American society and the world and what we can do. It relates to a different uh, Capitalism 21. Capitalist Carol was an, a novel, a novella on the lines of Christmas Carol, and yes, there's ghosts come in and all that type of stuff. And I hope it's an enjoyable read. Thank you, Amy, for a, a, a plug onto that. So please look at that, and uh, I hope that you'll find it enjoyable. Those are the logos that are on the front of those two books. The one on the on the right right hand side, the five uh, realms of power are out of balance. The one on the left hand side says capitalism is different today. It has been different in America at least four times, and we need to have a fifth time of change on it. Don't let anybody tell you that, oh, capitalism here and their social, we've got everything under the sun, what we've been doing. We need to alter the nature of America in politics and economics. And I put the book out, people can disagree with it, but hopefully we can discuss some of it. There is a sub-theme inside the Capitalist Carol about cook stoves. And I'm going to show you some things about the cook stoves in here. This is producing carbon offsets. It's a major scale up efforts, and I am looking for anybody in here, investors, know people who could want to do things for impact and stuff, happy to talk with you. If nothing else, just spread the word and help me find someone who can be doing it. Charcoal. The only thing I'm emphasizing in here is that charcoal is the co product or byproduct of pyrolysis or carbonization, they go together. 
and I worked on it at all different scales in there. There are, this is a slide I'd like you to pay a lot of attention to. The profit center, profit centers, okay? How are you gonna make this pay? In the lower left-hand corner, there is pyrolytic biomass <coughs> reduction and disposal. Get rid of the stuff that you don't want. It's a fire hazard around your house, it's ugly, it's something else, it's waste products from other processes. Can that one pay the bills? That's fine. Then you get the upper left-hand corner, the charcoal is free. Or for biochar or other purposes, but maybe you did it for the biochar and then the waste removal is free. Thermal energy, upper right-hand corner. We need to heat our schools during winter time and things using biomass, which we are otherwise doing. Why in the world do we take fossil fuels to create electricity, to run electric heaters in different places? I mean, this is the most inefficient things that there are, uh, that there are around. And then other miscellaneous, there's the chemical side, carbon offsets, which I will talk about, and of course, the climate benefits, these intangible things that we have to deal with. Any one of those four should be enough to pay for the whole bill. <coughs> and we could get all three of them. Here I'm showing a picture of the of a cook stove, which is on, it's one of them is on the, the table for the demonstrations into here, a humanitarian project. Support that one. Help out just for the humanitarian projects of helping the, some of the poorest people on earth who are cooking on three stone fires and cooking with wood and will not have another choice in their lifetime or for many generations. That alone is the value for it. And this is the standard model for our uh, um, for projects and things. And mission accomplished over here, fine. Do it if for no other reason than that. But in this whole other part in here, we're going to have a different things that I'm going to show you in just a second here as it comes in. There's power of large numbers, 35,000 stoves out into there, the 25 tons of charcoal a day. God, get past it. This is in uh, uh, in India, uh, Bangladesh is the country in the, the grayish part on the left-hand map, and my project area is this one right down into there, or up into here, this little town of Hingelganj into there. The 35,000 stoves are in these two areas. These are ongoing projects. Would love to do it. I can make a long presentation about every one of these things. For that project, this is where there's 500 of the, we've got 1,000 stoves now, 500 stoves out there, and the detail in this little spot right here, there's actually a pond in the middle. And these are households of Indians, each one of them with one of these particular stoves. Imagine that area throughout this whole thing here, and then go back to all of West Bengal, let's do a million stoves, let's go on. And the numbers are enormous. Albert talked about a, a gigaton of carbon uh, reduction, okay, or the, the charcoal. You can do that with just the cook stoves that are needed around the world. There's an example in the area, okay, and going on through here is uh, talking about the blockchain arrangement. There's that same diagram, and what we have done is in this area here, we have made possible extra monetary benefits because of the blockchain creation that was into there for and carbon credits, carbon offsets. So that particular thing in the this part here, we have a thing called char track. I have developed that. This is it utilizes blockchain. Blockchain is an is an application. It's not the it is a is a tool. It's not an actual application. And we do buyer, buyers of offsets or founders and things like that. Have a nonprofit into there. This is what makes these things happen so that we can actually fund them. This is not in Southern Illinois, but maybe we find some other way that goes along. We've got different groups into their carbon accounting. Uh, not worth, okay. Blockchain, you must have data. We have a form like this signed by every household that got the stole. This is how we prove that these things are out there and are used. Notice they don't even sign their name, it's a thumbprint. Data entry that comes into it, it's all tracked. This is, we're talking about what is blockchain. If you're interested in something that has carbon accounting and use carbon, we go for that right there. The, uh, uh, they've got our 
charcoal collection on daily levels, weekly reports must be recorded. This is what blockchain is good for and does. It's not just a database. Carbon offsets, oh, all right. 16 carbon offsets for every average American. These slides are all going to be out there. Everybody can get them and look at them at their leisure. A carbon offsets today are between $13 in California, $28 in Europe, elsewhere around there. Will be certificates like that coming in. Now, charcoal making. I didn't see your last sign, so I'm <laughs> a camera now time. All right, we're almost done. I'm into the last stage about how we make these, these things. Retorts, these are on the back table into there, flame cap, I can talk about those. Anderson Kiln is an item which I'm discussing in the back, we'll be talking about it tomorrow more with, with uh, uh, at Albert's time. Heated screws, uh, an air curtain burner, a carbonator, this device into here is a $600,000 piece of equipment. I don't think we need it for Southern Illinois. I think we want to use an Anderson kiln, but that's a separate topic, and I need to talk with people who want to do it. This is what I do in my backyard. My neighbors do not complain that I make back biochar in a barrel in my backyard in, the, in normal Illinois. A slightly bigger version on it. That's a bigger version still, which is a fuel container. Models of that are in the back side back there. This is a uh, a larger size, the, the, the gallonage on it is four and a half cubic meters. A shipping container, 20 footer, is, a, uh, is 30 cubic meters to get our volumes up. Last slide. Yes. Three major efforts. One is Save America from Itself. I got two books about that. Let's look at that. The second one is support wood gas stoves for impoverished people around the world by carbon offsets. Talk to me about that. We can work on it and doing things. The last one is develop the use of farm and forest pyrolysis. The larger kilns and things are possible and that's the project for Southern Illinois. And I think we need to talk with the agencies and the Shawnee Forests and the Springfield and uh, uh, Kofi. We want a forester in it, and one who understands Ghana and these international types of things and stuff like that. The other ones, the, you, the guy from the USDA, I spoke with him, he's interested. Amy, you're interested, you don't have a choice, you're interested. <laughs> Looking forward to talking with everyone on the, uh, for these organizations. So, there's my contact information, a few questions and comments. Thank you. whiplash on that, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I've got some questions here that I just want to address to the entire panel. If you can e each just give a brief response based on your, your contributions here today. So the first question I'm going to ask is, in your area of expertise, what are important trends that people can take advantage of right now? What are, and what are things that you think are going to happen uh, in the near future or the far future? So if you could just talk about trends according to your um, your area that you talked about today. And coffee, Dr. Akamani, do you wanna start? And we have microphones there. Thank you. Trends and issues. Um, one of my areas of research is the sustainability of forest dependent communities. And so uh, the presentation largely summarizes some of those trends that we are moving away from the view of uh, communities as stable, predictable, uh, whose well being is measured on in economic terms, to the view that community well being has multiple dimensions and that communities and uh, communities exist in uh, they are not isolated entities, but they are part of a multi-level world and they are exposed to multiple forces of change. And so that view of looking at the sustainability of communities, I think, is gaining widespread recognition among uh, scientists and decision makers. And so the idea of community resilience and community capacity uh, is gaining ground. Uh, a lot of the 
early works are focused on trying to understand uh, how communities respond to change. Uh, and so the framework that I presented represents some of the efforts that we are on. That was something that I did as part, as part of my institution work. Uh, I do have my own modifications of that framework, but there are a number of frameworks out there trying to explain how communities respond to change events, uh, like climate change impacts or changes in forest policy. Uh, other aspects involve uh, the measurement of community resilience. Uh, what are indicated that decision makers and scientists can use to assess the level of resilience of a particular community. Uh, again, the capital assets framework uh, is often used for that purpose. There are still other issues like what is the appropriate skill for assessing the resilient community? Is it the individual or the city? Also, or is it the community or is it the regional thing which is allocated? Uh, we know that existing past studies have typically focused on a single level of analysis, and so increasingly we are beginning to pay attention to the issue of scale, that there's really no one correct scale in assessing resilience if you are looking at it from a complex systems perspective. So the idea of looking at resilience from multiple skills is also uh, gaining attention. But then that obviously raises the issue of then what kinds of indicators. We need different indicators at different levels or we need you know, a common set of indicators at the various levels. So these are some of the issues that I believe uh, researchers have been looking at uh, in the literature. Uh, tying that to forest policy and tying that to something that is relevant for upper cost CA uh, is the idea that uh, the changes in forest policy can actually benefit communities in a number of ways. And so when the Northwest Forest Plan was adopted, uh, that introduced the idea of ecosystem management. It was radically different from older policies that emphasized uh, sustained yield of timber over the years. And so it was widely predicted that uh, communities in the Pacific Northwest were going to collapse. Uh, Ten years after the policy, communities are not collapsed. The region had gained about 4 million jobs. And part of the explanation was that with forest protection, uh, the amenity values in the region had increased, and people were then moving to that region. And that when people moved to a particular area, uh, jobs followed the people. And so the idea of amenity-based community development has since emerged to replace the older model of development that emphasized uh, the export of particular products as well as promoting local and regional economies. And so resource protection <coughs> and resource restoration are now being seen as potential engines for promoting uh, rural development. And so in the forestry sector, the idea of Amenity migration, as I talked about, emerged in the 1990s to explain why communities were still thriving, even though the forest that they depended on had reduced timber production by about 90%. Uh, that idea has since brought in, and more recently, uh, foresters are talking about the idea of restoration economics. The, throughout the US on public lands, forests are uh, recognized as being vulnerable to uh, widespread fires because of 100 years of fire suppression. So policy is increasingly moving towards recognizing the need to undertake large-scale restoration efforts. Uh, that restoration would include uh, mechanical planning, uh, the harvesting of timber to reduce the density of the forest, and then introducing prescribed uh, fires to return the forest to fire adapted landscapes. And so that is also being seen as an opportunity that communities can tailor their local economies around benefiting from products instead of from restoration periods. And so the idea that ecosystem preservation can contribute to community development uh, is also being used in the broader literature on climate change adaptation, for instance, where a concept like ecosystem-based adaptation is also being introduced that to build community resilience to climate change, we need to maintain healthy ecosystems that are more resilient to climate change impacts, but also provide both goods and services that want to be to Kelly? Thank you. <laughs> so what he said, yes. Um, so, as you can already tell, I'm coming from a totally different place. What the information I'm bringing here, but here's where I tell you a trend that I'm seeing, and that is, 
we have a generation of folks who are young people who are suffering from nature deficit disorder. This more kids in the woods thing, it is real. And I, I host, you know, hundreds of high school and college age students every year and they are as disconnected from nature as as you oh they ask me if the forest is planted. You know, like they they have no they just they don't understand it. So well, I think they care about the world and they care about climate change. I think those are just ideas out there. Like they think stewardship is picking up trash. Well, yeah, that's part of it. But there's way more to stewardship than just picking up trash. And I, I don't know how we're going to fix it. I mean, I do my best. I'm not a, a, an educator by any way, shape, or means. But I just think the more kids I bring here, I give them a chance to sit in the woods, to be by themselves to disconnect from the, the modern world, reconnect to nature. Um, it makes a big difference, um, but really, I, don't, I think that kids are really disconnected from the natural world, and, and I think it's, um, it's, it's a sad time. So anyway, that's what I'm thinking. Thank you, nature deficit disorder, that's a thing. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if this mic is working at all. The uh, example I want to give is coming from Stephen McGreedy in Japan. Uh, and it shows that there's a, a connection between the pent-up consumer demand that comes from climate shock and a potential for economic development and sustainable rural development. That example is this rural uh, farm co-op in uh, Hozu province in Japan. And they uh, were having problems because of the aging demographic, right? The older people were on the farm, the younger people had left to go work in jobs in the city, and the smallholders were having difficulty managing the commons of the hillsides that were being overgrown with bamboo, which in earlier years would have been harvested. And now there were uh, wild boars coming in, living in the bamboo, and then ravaging the countryside, and the rice fields and so forth. So now you have a problem. The Extension Service at Kamokea University uh, went out there and looked at the situation and suggested that they make biochar from bamboo. So they did. They had Hozu Farmers Co-op made bamboo biochar. Uh, they put it in their uh, cabbage patches and on their vegetable crops and they got much better at nutrient dense food and then they did a special marketing effort and they made value added products like cool slaw that would cool the planet and they sold that in the grocery stores at a premium and sold out and they did a survey well why are people buying this because they're concerned for their children they're concerned for what the planet's going to be like there was this consumer pent up demand for products like cool slaw that could, cut, that could be cooling the planet while they're producing good nutrient-dense food. And that example then spread to you know, publications where they're putting uh, information literature into schools, comic books with Mr. Biochar, Dr. Biochar, going into the field and curing the, the soil infertility and how that then generates uh, these wonderful, luscious, big, fat foods and big, fat carrots and big, fat cabbages. And so on. So this is a. This became a viral meme, and it became a way to re, uh, rebuild the rural economy. The farmers are doing very well, thank you very much. The bamboo is fixed; it's no longer a problem. It's seen as an asset. The wild boars don't ravage the rice, and all these knock-on benefits. And so this is the takeaway. There's actually uh, a huge potential there, just waiting to be tapped, of cooling the planet while meeting the sustainable development goals. Matching up the 100 drawdown technologies to the 17 sustainable development goals. Thank you, Albert. So to piggyback basically what Albert was saying is that honestly that's really the trends when it comes to 
um, ways for cycling. Ultimately, people want to do better. They want to know what to do with the stuff. They don't necessarily want to see stuff go to the landfill. They, they learn about all kinds of different options. And then, so there's these trends that are moving forward trying to teach people about other options that are out there. Rather than just recycling, what else is there? So um, there's also a big trend in both the city as well as other organizations and nonprofits to try to present those alternatives whatever they may be, whether it's market alternatives or just kind of everyday alternatives that people can implement within their homes. We're in Springfield trying to increase and look forward to innovations and trying to see what's going to work within the city itself within our own means. Some things we can do, some things we can't, and also trying to get the education out there to get organizations involved, um, even outside organizations or outside innovators to come in and to help us kind of make innovations. Those are big trends. We are the capital city, so kind of moving things forward, progressing things forward. We definitely want to look forward with local legislation as well. What does that mean in terms of legislation, moving things forward? Sometimes legislation can hold you back. You're not looking at what's going to happen in five years, what possible trends 10 years, 15 years down the road. So legislation actually becomes a little more difficult today because you have to be very aware of what trends are actually occurring in marketplaces and mentalities and just kind of an innovation and science and where that might actually go. So legislation has to kind of meet that call as well um, or else it can also become you know, kind of a downfall in a way. So there's a lot of different trends to get in place. Um, Thank you, Zina. Oh, yes. Trends, biochar, it's coming along. Next, at the end of this month, at the end of this month in uh, uh, Colorado is the U.S. United States Biochar Initiative Conference. I've been to about six of these from and around the world. Different things. It is happening. You might not be hearing about it, but some things are happening. It was already mentioned that on the 19th, Friday, the 19th of July, up in Goodfield, Illinois, we are having the Illinois Biochar Group. It meets uh, for one day, each about three times a, a year, different things, and that this one is going to be particularly about the char production methodologies, which I have been talking about and showing you. It. It'll probably be among the first sort of public showings and actually out uh, with fire ignited. So I got those two plugs in. I'll plug also, don't forget tonight, 6 o'clock, or shortly thereafter, at the... Long right Break. Right. What? Long, Long Break. Right okay, right around the corner, uh, for those that want to go there and eat, it's Dutch Street, put your own way. My final comment on trends, increasing urgency. We are going to see this stuff just jump out in the face of people and say, what? What's that? Never heard about it. And we're, hopefully we're a little bit further along the curve than some of these other people are, please consider it, take it as an urgent case. Okay, thank you. All right. We have, we're over time, I apologize. Um, I'm just going to take one question from the audience. I need a question that can go to every single panelist there where they can give a brief answer. Does anybody have such a question? Okay, Chubb. There are alternatives to plastic. They are making reeds out of, you know, for straws of Vietnam, they're making edible six-pack holders go in the ocean that the fish could eat. They are making bottles out of hemp that degrade. What else can we do? I'll start simply by saying, get those ideas out there and so that we are implementing them. The industries which make the plastics and do this stuff, they have every reason to not make the change. So. Uh, that's what we need We need to do. There's a variety of things I think that have to do. I think coming from a government standpoint, we really need the citizens within the cities, within the state, within the nation to stand up and say that's what they want in the marketplace, that's what they want to buy, and without, every single time you buy something, you're voting for that, right? You're voting for that item, you're voting, and you're saying that I actually want that, I want to consume that. So if you don't want to consume that, you need to actually voice it. You need to go to your local alderman, to your city council meetings. You need to voice your opinion. You might be the quote unquote crazy person in the room, but eventually it'll catch on. People start hearing about biochar and all these other terms and all these other things, and they'll start to see, you know, whether it's European innovations or other innovations, you know, coming through the U.S. They'll start to see it coming on, and you just need people to push it. The constituents have to actually voice. 
Buy my book. <laughs> Transforming Plastics from Pollution to Evolution, uh, April 2019, on the back table. And it's got a whole chapter on plastic straws. Buy their books. <laughs> I don't know much about plastics in particular, but I look at this as a policy question. And so I will address it from that perspective. I, uh, it's good to know that there are alternatives that are being explored. Uh, I think, you know, just prioritizing the safe for alternative systematic efforts in terms of researching and trying new alternatives uh, is an important starting point. Uh, so if we were to effect any form of policy change, uh, what are we going to do? And coming from a resilience perspective, uh, the first thing would be to create awareness about the issue, uh, that the existing situation is not desirable and that there's a need for change. Uh, but being able to communicate that information requires that we need to have an alternative that is going to work better to be able to convince stakeholders. So access to information is important. Uh, the next thing is we need to be able to convince stakeholders that the alternative is better than the existing situation. And that means clarifying the cost of the existing situation and being able to highlight the benefits of the alternative. Again, that's a function of information, but we can also include uh, various government policies that provide the right kinds of incentives for the alternative to work better. Then, at, at that point, we can be, uh, begin to think about, you know, if people are aware and they find it interesting, then it's about making it possible for them to act. And that comes down to providing the right kinds of resources and the right kinds of opportunities for stakeholders to be involved. Uh, I agree with the uh, previous you know, speakers highlighting the fact that change is always difficult. There are people benefiting from the existing situation. You know, the, uh, you know, industrial partners benefiting from the plastics, uh, the use of plastics. And so I think the biggest challenge would be to overcome the Dominance of vested interests who, at every step of the way, will resist you know, that kind of change by distorting the information and fighting against legislation that provides uh, opportunities and resources to change. Okay, well, on that note, thank you to my panel for your insights on innovation in the climate economy, and we hope to see you again sometime in the future. And so, let's give our Panel one last round of applause.